Good morning. I see you all made it for the time change. Uh, welcome to weekend edition of Breakfast with Spaniels. Um, <clears throat> I was right. They were good. We didn't need to set an alarm. They got us up when the sun came up, which was 7.10 on the new time, so 6.10 the old time. So they were right on schedule, but you know, at least now they're an hour later, so it's all good. It's all good. Um, Charlie's usually the one that wakes us up. He starts with a wow, 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 wow. <laughs> he sounds like uh, the teacher on the Charlie Brown cartoons. Um, and that's what we wake up to every morning. And holy cow, is it cold here. Oh my gosh. Even the, the miniature horses were hiding in the barn with their blankets on this morning. They were like, yeah, we are not doing this today. And I woke up with that music in my head the other day. Well, you want to know something funny? Hugh and I both had a dream about the Spaniels doing their own show and the conversation that they were having. So you guys are gonna get that probably later in the week. It was absolutely hysterical. So of course, we're both doing dog voices talking to each other this morning <laughs> with the show that they're going to do. So um, it was pretty funny. And we both dreamt about the same topic, which is even weirder. So um, it'll be kind of fun. Morning from the UK, hi Jane. And I think I saw Marita a little bit ago too. Um, so we were watching the Weather Channel this morning and it's the middle of March and we are going to have a blizzard on Tuesday. So depending on who you listen to, we're either getting four to five inches of snow on Tuesday or we're getting 12 to 18 inches. Let me just say, if we had gone to the Caribbean for the month of February, which is what we'd like to do, um, we would have come home to this misery. So now we're just thinking we, we either just have to move south or we have to go from like January through the end of March because this is ridiculous. So we had a schedule for all the dogs. You get the blizzard tomorrow. Yeah, I saw you You guys look like you're only getting a few inches though. I, I don't know. We're getting double wallops. It's coming up from the south and from the west that they're going to hit together and make this kaboom. So... Um, we have a bunch of dogs scheduled to go to the groomer on Tuesday. And Floss, if you're watching, I'm not sure we're going to get there on Tuesday. I'm going to call and see if we can schedule a couple for Wednesday instead. Ugh, craziness. Um, so, I, I, there's Marita. I knew she was here. So, anyway, today is my father's 82nd birthday. So, happy birthday, Richard Morgan. I know he doesn't do the computer, but maybe he'll hear that over my mom's shoulder. And it is a nor'easter, Kevin. It's going to be a whopper. So, um, and then my sister's birthday is Thursday. And um, so that's March 16th. And 50, oh my God, how old is she going to be? 59 years ago, 59, 58, 59 years ago, she was born in a horrible, horrible blizzard. And when my mom brought her home from the hospital, they didn't have any power for a week. And so they were all in my aunt's house, all uh, sitting around the wood stove and, you know, trying to stay warm. And um, so I guess mid-March is kind of not fun for us around here. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> that's Georgie. He, he needs to go beg food from uh, Nanny and Pop Pop. That's what he's barking for. Yep, there he goes. <laughs> oh, beggar. He's so chubby. Um, so, you know, we, Hugh and I were talking this morning, and a year ago, for my dad's birthday, we had come back from the Caribbean at the very end of February, and we had brought him a, um, a oh, I should have brought it in, we brought a framed menu from a bar that he used to sit in all the time in Nevis, 
when my parents used to go to Nevis, I think 27 or 28 years they went to Nevis. It's a little island down by St. Kitts. Um, and uh, every year they would go for the month of February, and that's kind of where we got the idea. And they haven't been able to go the last few years, so, ah, oh, Hugh, you're such a good man. So if anybody's ever been to Nevis, this is the menu from Nevis, um, from a little bar on the beach called Sunshine's. And Sunshine is this big dude from Nevis who figured out how to make a ton of money serving, um, what are they, killer bees? Which is a rum drink that is pretty much a killer. Um, at this beach bar in the island of Nevis, and my dad used to, there was another little bar that was next to it that uh, my dad liked even better. They had good lobster sandwiches, but um, it got washed away in a hurricane, so then my dad had to move over to Sunshine's. My mom always liked to walk on the beach, so she would just walk for hours a day, and my dad was not so much of a walker, so he would sit at the beach bars. My mom would walk up and down the beach and stop in once in a while and have a drink and have lunch and then go walk some more on the beach. And um, so Hugh and I, uh, we've, we've tried to follow in their footsteps, so um, every time we go down that direction, we hop over to Nevis and go to Sunshine's, and so when we were there last time, we sat with Sunshine for a little bit and asked him if he would sign the menu for my dad. So we gave that to him for his birthday, which I guess was on a Saturday last year. And um, when we came back from the Caribbean, we always we only lived about five, six miles from my parents. And we always made a point to go over and um, make them dinner and, and visit with them for, you know, a couple evenings a week, um, you know, with my crazy work schedule. But we always felt that it was very important to go check on them and make sure they were okay and give my mom a break from cooking and he would make dinner and we would take it over. And so we were talking and we said, you know, for my dad's birthday last year, we gave him the thing from Nevis and, you know, he was kind of quiet and, you know, we figured, oh, well, they miss going to the islands, which I know they do. Um, but, you know, things were just a little off, but nobody was saying anything. And it was really only a few days later that um, everything kind of fell apart. And we realized that my parents were really, really struggling um, with my dad's care and taking um, care of themselves. And it really was only a few days later than where we are right now where Hugh and I ended up literally just camping out on their living room floor for quite a few months. And my dad was in and out of the hospital and rehab and it was a really ugly few months. And, um, you know, we weren't really sure where things were going from that point. And so that kind of brings me to my topic for today, which uh, somebody asked me to talk about. How do you deal with devastating news? Because literally a year ago, we thought that our world was crashing down and um, that we were going to lose my dad. He was in such, such poor health and in such bad shape um, for, oh boy, about eight to ten weeks. We, I mean, it was really touch and go and really rough. And, um, you know, we I remember talking to doctors who, um, you know, you can't get straight answers from anyone and nobody nobody knew and nobody could tell us, you know, what to expect. and. Um, it was just a really, really, really hard time, and then we had to have that conversation about moving in together, and I didn't, I didn't think they would ever go for it, and thankfully they did, and everything has just, my dad is so much better. Um, sometimes you'll see him, actually it's not pointed that way today, but sometimes you'll see him in the background walking back and forth with his walker. Um, but thankfully things have, have really turned around for the better, and you know, we've seen the future. We know you know, what could happen in, you know, years down the line. Um, but what do you do when you get devastating news? You know, what did we do when I got that phone call about Myra? Where's my little Myra girl? Come here, sweetie. It's from our, from our Myra. Yeah, Myra collection up there. So back in, um, September was Labor Day weekend. Myra had her second surgery for an obstruction in her bowel. The first one we thought was from a piece of wedged pineapple, and then we got the second surgery and found, you know, took out that piece of bowel, and a week later the surgeon called and said, we got the biopsy back, and it's lymphoma of the bowel. And 
I was lucky because I got the phone call in the car. I had, you know, I had I actually pulled off at a garden center and I sat there and I, I'll never forget where I was when I got the news. And that's one of those things, you know, when the World Trade Center planes hit, you know, I remember exactly where I was and what I was doing. And when you get devastating news, you'll never forget where you are. And it just, you know, it's one of those things, you know, it's like I say with horses, they remember every bad thing that's ever happened to them, but you do something good and it's gone in three seconds, you know. Um, yeah, I know the bulged out eye look too. Yeah, it's horrible. You know, you, you get that news. And, you know, I remember when I got the news and, and there are four stages of grief that you go through. And the first one is, I, I, I think I have them right and I should have looked them up. I think the first one's denial. No, that's not real. No, 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 can't be, can't be. And I, I just remember, you know, when I was talking to the surgeon, I was like, okay, all right, good. Well, you know, you got it all out, right? Oh, yeah, we got it all out. Okay, good. Well, we're going to go see an oncologist and, you know, we'll move forward from there. And so I instantly started making a plan. And so I was able, it was about a 20-minute phone call. And in that 20 minutes, I went from denial pretty quickly into, okay, we can deal with this, you know. So then you, you kind of get into that acceptance thing. Um and so I just started making a plan very, very quickly. And of course, when I came home, I had already processed all that. And I had about, you know, 40 minutes to get through all of that. And when I walked in the door and I saw Hugh, I, I said, oh, I just got a phone call from the surgeon and Myra has lymphosarcoma in the bowel. And, you know, Hugh didn't have it. I didn't, I didn't precede it with anything, you know, like, oh, I've got some bad news. You know, usually if you want to break bad news to someone, you kind of give them a lead in. You know, you give them the, I've got good news and bad news. Or the, ah, you know, I, I've got something to tell you. You might want to get yourself together. Um, you know, so it's always better if you can give a little preamble. And I didn't because I had already kind of processed things a little bit. And so... I walked in and I said, oh, Hugh, I just talked to my resurgeon and she's got lymphosarcoma of the bowel. And, you know, he, yes, that terrorizing news. And he kind of got that, you know, terror thing. And his eyes bugged out of his head and he burst into tears and just walked out of the room. Because for him, he, he you know, there wasn't even denial. He just instantly went to grief um, and couldn't process it. So, of course, then I had to kind of, then I had to do the, okay, honey, you know, and, and build up to it, which was backwards, wrong way to do it. Um, you know, but I had already had a plan in my head. And, and so, you know, you really, when you get that devastating news, give yourself, hi from Sweden, <laughs> um, spring, sunny day. Yeah. I'm glad it's sunny there. Um, yes. Pookie does leaving, but love being live on cam. She's a princess. This is, this is, but when you get that devastating news, give yourself a few minutes to kind of let it sink in, go ahead and be in denial, be in grief, burst into tears, whatever it is that you need in that initial moment. Because if you don't allow yourself to have that initial shock, oh my God, you're never going to hear the next words that follow that are going to help you make a plan. And it's amazing how many times I will give bad news to somebody in the office and then I follow up with, you know, a half hour of explanations of, okay, we can do this, we've got this option, this option, this option. And they go home and they cry and then the next day I get a phone call and they go, I didn't hear a word you said. Because they couldn't, you know, there's no way to process that. And um, so you need to give yourself a moment. And so if you're standing in the veterinary office or the doctor's office, and they hit you with bad news or you're on the phone and you know and they call and they give you bad news give yourself a little bit of time and if you can't deal with you know and you, you know there's 700 questions going through your head hang up the phone tell the doctor you know you need a couple of minutes take time to let it process for a few minutes if you can't process it fast enough to then have that follow-up conversation of what's next then hang up the phone or go home and then call back and say, okay, I, I, I've had time to process that a little bit. Now I, I have questions and now I, I need to know how do I move forward from here? If you've had a chance, write down a list of questions. You know, because I deal with this every day, I had a pretty good idea in my mind what I needed to do next with Myra. 
um, yeah, grief doesn't always follow the rules. It's going to be different for everyone. Um, so, you know, give yourself time and then after you've had time to, you know, let it sink in a little bit and you've had time to bawl your eyes out or scream or, you know, like you walk out of the room, walk outside, whatever it is you need to do, then you need to kind of bring yourself back down to, all right, now I need to think. I need to think clearly and I need to talk to someone who can give me answers. And a lot of times I'll get emails in my inbox. I've just had devastating news. I don't know what to do first. Where do I go? And I will always try to answer those emails or those messages because you don't know what to do. And, um, you know, so try to sit down, make a list of questions so that when you do talk to your veterinarian or one of the technicians, or if your plan is I'm going to go see an oncologist, you know, have some of those questions ready so that you make good use of that time because you're, unfortunately, you're going to get this little window of time um, because, you know, I feel sorry for oncologists because, you know, all day long they've got people in panic mode um, who are just, you know, in different stages of the grief process. And every once in a while, like our journey with Myra, you get good news and you're celebrating and, you know, and then the next week you've got bad news again and you have to go through the whole process all over again. And there's, you know, cancer doesn't follow the rules. Grief doesn't follow the rules. Everyone will be different. And you are going to have people in your life who say, it's just a dog. It's just a cat. Why are you so upset? Someone posted on Facebook the other day, you know, I, I'm so devastated over the loss of my dog that I just, I can't move forward. I can't function. And I'm sorry because all I keep posting is things about my dog and my grief and my loss. And I'm really sorry. And the thing is, that's where she is in her grief. And she's not able to move forward yet. And that's okay. And you know what? Her supportive friends, and there were many, let me tell you, you will find out who your true friends are. Many friends supported her and said, you keep posting whatever it is that you need to post. And the people who say it's just a dog, they don't get where we are. Ugh, fell to my knees, literally could not breathe when my vet told me she couldn't save my heart dog. Yes. Yes. Um, I've been there. You know, we've had sudden losses. We've had, we never have had a planned loss because I don't schedule euthanasia out. You know, it, when it happens, it happens. Um, yes, insensitive people. That, well, they just don't understand that for us, these guys really are pretty much the level of my children. I mean, you know, God forbid something would happen to my children. I won't, I don't, I don't know how I'll handle it. And obviously I will. Um, you know, we all lose our, our parents. We all, you know, we hope that we predecease our children because I can't imagine that. Um, when I was, oh boy, I was uh, in college. Uh, I remember our phone ringing at two o'clock in the morning and my mother answered it and then I heard her crying in their bedroom. And so I knew something, you know, something devastating had happened. You don't get phone calls at two o'clock in the morning followed by tears. And my cousin who was a senior in high school had been killed in a car accident on prom night. And, um, you know, I, I always thought for my aunt and uncle, how do you get over that? How? She was their fourth child. She was their youngest. And I don't think they ever really did get over it. Um, but they carried on and they, they did what you need to do. And we do the same with, with these guys. When I lost my heart dog, Laura, I thought I would never get over it. And, oh my God, I don't know how many, it's been three to four year, four years, I think. Um, and it still hurts. It hurts my heart as much now as it did then. The loss of Myra. I mean, that one's fresher, but um, it still hurts. And it will take you a long time. What I can say is that when you do lose a pet that's very important to you, and they're all important to us, you know, there are, there are those that we call our heart dogs that are really, really just right there for us. Um, find a support group. There are many pet loss groups. Someone contacted me the other day. They lost their dog oh, two to three weeks ago, I think. And she said, I just, I can't move forward. I can't move forward. I need to talk to an animal communicator. Let me tell you, whether you believe in them or not, animal communicators can make 
your life so much better. Um, my sister, oh man, she gave me the name of somebody, Maureen Harmonay, H-A-R-M-O-N-A-Y, has a Facebook page. My sister said she's awesome. Um, Hugh and I were at an event in New York City. Uh, Pookie and George were on the red carpet for the film, Dog Film Festival. And there was an animal communicator there. And so we had George and Pookie with us, and we were all dressed up. He was writing me a note, oh boy. And uh, grief person on Long Island. Oh, oh, Kimberly Johns Johnson? Johnson. I wanted to say Johnston, but it's Johnson. Um, she is a grief counselor. She's a psychotherapist, I think, but a grief counselor on Long Island has offered to help um, anyone who is struggling with this. She gives lectures. She is awesome. She's in our Cavalier groups. Pookie, you leaving? Okay. Um, uh, but just really, really awesome. And she helps a lot of rescue people because if you're in rescue, you know, there's a lot of grief um, that you carry around and a, a lot of uh, heartache that we deal with in rescue. So it can, it can be pretty hard. Um, so, but anyway, I saw my story of the animal communicator. We were in New York at this event. We had Pookie and George with us. And so people were going over and they were having the communicator. She was an old woman. She was 81. She was from Minnesota and she, her daughter had put her on a plane and flown her out for this event. And so we went over to talk to her and I sat down and Hugh was standing next to me. We were each holding a dog and she looked at me and she said, you don't want to talk about these dogs, do you? And it was only, man, it was a year and a half after we lost Laura. And she said, you don't want to talk about these dogs, do you? And I said, no, I don't. And she said, uh, you want to talk about one that you lost and it's been a while. And I said, yes, yes, I do. And, you know, so I, instantly I knew this woman um, was pretty darn good. And she said, um, she asked me her name and I told her. And she said, Laura needs you to know that you need to get over your guilt. You and your husband are both suffering with heavy hearts from guilt and we did we felt very guilty Laura was a sudden loss and we felt very guilty about it and we couldn't move forward because of that and she said Laura can't move forward because you are not allowing her to move forward because you are holding so much guilt you need to let go of that so that she can move on and we were both hysterical, but I have to tell you, it was one of the most powerful moments in my life. And it helped me to realize that we can hold them in a plane. And if you don't believe in this stuff, just tune off. It's fine. Um, we can hold them in a plane that does not allow them to move over to the next level. There uh, is a wonderful website, Spirits in Transition, that talks about the three levels of dying and when the animals can move on to the next level and how euthanasia fits into that. Um, and, you know, so Hugh and I did have to find a way to get over the guilt and allow Laura to move forward. And again, we did it for her. I mean, it helped us immensely because we were really stuck. Um, and something else that was very interesting, and this came through my sister's communicator, which is very interesting. So I'm just thinking that Laura hasn't had an awful lot to say and maybe st probably still does. But um, and Laura was a rescue mill mama who um, almost died. She she was bought at the auction for twenty dollars out in Missouri and um, was just in horrible shape. And her foster mom in Indiana, Donna Ellis, spent thousands of her own money at the emergency service with Laura the first night uh, trying to save her life and I'm so thankful that she did because it totally changed my life with that little dog. Um, but we were, uh, and because of Laura, that was why Hugh and I got so involved in that uh, Cavalier auction out in Southern Missouri because that was the auction that Laura had come through. And we were bound, bent, and determined that we were going to be there and we were going to rescue more dogs in Laura's honor. So when I got home from work and I jumped in the van ready to leave, Hugh had Laura's collar hanging from the handle over the door inside the van. 
and I burst into tears and I said, okay, th this, this is the purpose of our mission. We are doing this for Laura. And, um, I was texting with my sister. Somehow I was communicating with her and she said, you need to open Laura's collar. And I said, what are you talking about? And her communicator had told her that when, so most of us save our, their collars. Um, I don't know where Myers is, it's around here somewhere. Um, we save their collars and they've got their little name tags on them. And so we have a lot of boxes of ashes and um, have their little name tags and then we have their collars with their name tags. And we had had Laura's collar hanging on a peg rack with a couple of other dogs that we had lost. And my sister said, the communicator said, you have to open their collar to allow their spirit to run free. When we leave the collar closed, we keep them on this plane. So whether it's true or not, I don't know. But from that point on, we open their collars after they pass and we save their collars, but they are saved in an open position, not closed. So for those of you, I know, amazing stuff. These communicators are pretty cool. So for those of you who are suffering with grief and you're questioning yourselves, give it up. Let your animals move on. Let them be there for when we get there. I did meet a woman, um, Roberta Grimes. She has some awesome, awesome books. I can't remember her website, um, but I've talked about her before. I met her at a, an author's thing in New York City at a media event. Um, she has a podcast that is uh, heard around the world by hundreds of thousands of people. She's actually a retired lawyer, um, but she has spent her life researching death and dying and her books are called things like the fun of dying because um, she says it's great on the other side and so I'm st I was standing in line behind her at this New York media event and you know we were waiting to talk to some TV producer or something and I tapped her on the shoulder and I said Roberta I need you to answer a question I need to know what happens to the animals in the afterlife. Will I get to see my dogs again? Because I'm just telling you right now. Uh, oh, it's robertagrimes.com. Okay, very, very easy. Um, I said, I need to know that I will see my animals again. Because if I'm not going to, then, you know, what's the point? And she said, oh, absolutely. Your animals will be there. And um, so I ended up buying all of her books that she had at the time, but there were three then. I think she's got a bunch more now. Uh, because I needed to know more and I needed to read about the animals and what's going to be on the other side for us. And um, basically, our animals go and they wait. And they're kind of in this beautiful space, but they're waiting for the people that love them to arrive. And then when we get there, we are all joined back together. And, you know, I, 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 it's going to be a swarm. And, oh, my gosh, Michelle Allen at Monkey's House, that poor woman, I mean, she's just going to be overwhelmed, overwhelmed. And um, for me, it, it, you know, one of the things that she said and is in her book that kind of bothers me is that animals who were never shown love on this earth will be stuck in that kind of in-between place. It's not a bad place, but they're not rejoined with their people. So, um, yeah, I hope it's true. Love them to death. So my answer to that is we need to love as many animals as we can while we're on this plane. My sister did a really, really good, um, Facebook live. It was, uh, and it's on her page, Sally Morgan PT CST. She, it was like her second or third one that she did. And it was, uh, Polo Pono Pono, something like that. It's a Hawaiian prayer for the animals um, that basically says, uh, you know, that I love you. And um, she talked about what happens when you see an animal that's injured on the road or you see an animal that's been killed on the road. How do you show your love for them? Um, you know, and how do we love more animals in the world? Even if you don't physically touch them, love them, have them in your house, how can you show that love for them. It was an excellent talk. Yeah, I, you know, if I can find it, I'll post it again. Um, it's only about 15, 20 minutes long, but it was really, really good. Um, 
And so, you know, we can, while we're here on this earth, obviously you're all animal lovers or you wouldn't be here this morning. We can love so many animals, whether they are wild animals, you know, whether it's, you know, the hawk attacking the bunny, you know, it's the circle of life. Um, you can show love and appreciation for so many animals and people in your life. So a little bit heavy today. That was your Sunday morning sermon. I told you I was going to do something, um, you know, kind of along these lines today. So uh, everybody have a wonderful, this is why I foster, I know. Love as many as you can, as many as you can. Um, everybody have a really fun day. We're going to celebrate dad's birthday and uh, try not to freeze to death. <laughs> I got to go to the barn today. Ah. <laughs> okay, everybody have a really good day and um, hug your kids. Hug your kids. Think about those you've lost, those you love.